Hi everyone, well this is the last of the series that we're going to do uh, in this interview between Scotty Morrison and Tama Potaka on uh, this program called Mirai. And we're just picking up on what Potaka said at the very end of his interview and uh, well, it's pretty significant, so let's get into it. Uh, the Māori Crown Relations Portfolio is also responsible uh, for implementing the settlement obligations that are outstanding, and there are over 10,000 of those outstanding, mainly with organisations and agencies such as Te Papa Atawhai, Department of Conservation, uh, and LINS, uh, Land Information New Zealand. So that's one area where I've got a big focus with my team at uh, Te Rafati is to make sure we understand the, the, the gamut of responsibilities that come after treaty settlements are arranged and the legislation has gone through okay, what obligations do we have now? And there's a lot of work that we have to do in that space to make sure we follow through. And the Crown's obligations do not stop when a settlement arrangement is concluded. Mm. Actually, they continue over time. And that's the promise of Te Tiriti of Waitangi, the Treaty of Waitangi. Wow. Didn't he say some incredible things, Tama Potaka? He said, quote, The Crown's obligations... The Crown's obligations do not stop when a settlement arrangement is concluded. Actually, he says, they continue over time. And that's the promise of Titiriti Awatangi. Well, my questions are these, are these statements true? The truth is, lies and truth are mixed up in these statements that Potaka just said. So I want to take you back to the treaty and what it actually says. So the, the British, via the treaty, promised Maori four things and only four things. One, the British promised Maori the establishment of a government for Maori and settlers that was a democracy because that's what they had in Britain and they just imported it here once the chiefs had ceded sovereignty. Now that's in the preamble of the treaty. So I'll put that in the, the preamble in the video description. Second thing the British promised, to protect Maori ownership of their possessions, land, dwellings and property. That's in Article 2, Paragraph 1. Now I'll put that in the description as well. The third thing the British promised the Maori was to purchase land from the chiefs. That's Article 2, Paragraph 2. I'll put that in as well. And the fourth thing was to grant all Maori British citizenship. So those are the four promises the British made to Maori, and they've kept the whole lot, absolutely to the letter. So how can Tama Potaka say, quote, the Crown's obligations do not stop when a settlement arrangement is concluded? Actually, they continue over time, and that's the promise of Titiriti o Waitangi. Okay. On what authority does he say these things? Like, where's he getting this from? Because I can tell you these ideas are certainly not in the treaty at all. Sure, his first statement is correct in that successive governments have been sucked in or duped by Maori activists and Maori MPs in Parliament to agree to give Maori cash and assets after settlement arrangements have been made. So, you know, when I said, OK, they promised to set up a government. Well, we have a government now that's the same in the line of the same government that was established in 1840, the one we have right now. And so it's not the treaty that did this, really, but it's the it's the government that was has been established in this country that made this arrangement. With Maori. Generally. They are called top-ups, these extra payments that are given, these payments that keep on going after a settlement's been reached. They're called top-ups. They use other terms like inflation adjustments and so on. There's various terms that they use to give ongoing cash to claimants once their claim is closed, as it were. Sometimes settlements, that's the agreement between the Crown and a, and a claimant, have ongoing annual payments built into the settlement, e.g. the government says, or well, the government agrees to pay you, the claimants, $10 million a year for the next 50 years. There's lots of claims that had that kind of clause built into the settlement. 
But I can tell you this, top-ups are not mandated in the treaty and neither are ongoing obligations to Māori in the treaty. So where is Potaka getting these ideas? You know, like, where are these coming from? Where did the government get this from? Why did they cave in and agree to ongoing payments? Well, the answer is that certain key words in the treaty have been fraudulently manipulated over the last 50 years to put a spin on the meaning of the treaty, which were not there in 1840. In other words, the treaty that we are looking at today is completely different from the treaty that was signed in 1840. And activists have made those changes and have twisted the truth of the tr treaty, the meaning of the treaty. MPs have got sucked in. They've swallowed the activist narrative hook, line and sinker. And boom, suddenly we get ongoing payments going to claimants. MPs believe the fraud and the spin and so top-ups and never-ending payments have been agreed to by various political parties since 1975. 1975 was the year in which the Treaty of Waitangi Act was passed. One key word in the treaty which has been fraudulently manipulated is the word possession. This appears in the first paragraph of Article 2 which reads it as follows. The Queen of England confirms and guarantees to the chiefs and the tribes and to all the people of New Zealand the possession of their lands, dwellings and all their property. That's the first paragraph of Article 2 in the treaty. The word possession was translated by missionary Henry Williams on the night of the 4th of February 1840 into the words, quote, Tino Rangatiratanga. The British say it means just what it means, possession or ownership. I.e., the British promise Maori the possession or ownership of their land, dwellings and property. It was as simple as that. There is good reason, a brilliant reason, why Henry Williams chose Tino Rangatiratanga for possession. And this reason is detailed in the video description below. You've got to have a look at this. Uh, you've got to read the document that's in the video description about Tino Rangatiratanga. Historian Bruce Moon, marvellous historian in New Zealand and incredible guy, incredible brain, he says Tino Rangatiratanga means possession, just what I've just said. And there's the reference. And here's the, a little clip from his book, Tino Rangatiratanga, authority. That's what Maori say it means. It means they've got authority over New Zealand. And Bruce Moon says false doesn't mean authority, it meant possession. So he's arguing with Maori activists about the meaning of this word. And he says, well, he says to Maori, well, you say it, Tino Rangatira means you have authority over the whole of New Zealand, but that's false. It just means possession. Maori today say Tino Rangatiratanga means unqualified exercise of chieftainship. So they, they, they swap out, we have authority, that word authority over whole of New Zealand, but they get it from what they say is unqualified exercise of chieftainship. That's what they say it means. So what do they mean? They mean that Maori did not cede sovereignty in 1840 and that they are still chiefs over all of New Zealand today. Can you believe this? They say that they still own this country and are its rightful rulers, which is where you, they get the idea of authority from. And all non maori that's us, are effectively overstayers here. We a minority on our own venue. We are fighting now for crumbs of what we actually have right to, full and undisturbed sovereignty. Wow, wasn't that interesting? This dear lady, she doesn't seem to realise that her ancestors, the chiefs of New Zealand in 1840, 540 of them, no less, via the treaty, ceded sovereignty. 
She doesn't seem to realize this. Thus, in saying what she's saying, she's going against her ancestors. I would have thought that would be a massive insult inside married him. I would have thought she'd be, you know, put in a hangi. And not honouring the treaty. She's not honouring the treaty. In fact, this is treason. Saying that Maori want sovereignty. They want full rulership of New Zealand. They want to be the government. Well, how come the media is not picking up on this? I mean, honestly, everywhere all around the country we have activists holding up banners and placards with honour the treaty. This is their big thing. And here's one of their own not honouring the treaty. Advocating the exact opposite, breaking the treaty. Why isn't the media picking up on that? So this is how Tama Potaka can say this is in the treaty. He's basing his statement on a twisted, fraudulent understanding of this word, tina, these words, Tina Rangatiratanga, in the treaty. Now, I just want to mention something that's hugely important here. Let's just say that Maori didn't cede sovereignty. We know they did, and there's absolutely no doubt about that, 100%. And I'm going to make another video about that. But let's just say, for example, that they didn't cede sovereignty. Well, the fact is that they went on in the 60, 70 years after the treaty was signed on the 6th of February 1840 at Waitangi, to go and sell 92% of their land. They went on to sell 92% of their land. Now, if you sell land, you lose sovereign authority over that piece of land. You know that. If you sell your home wherever you live in New Zealand, when the new owner moves in, when they pay for it, the, the moment that land is paid for, sovereignty is transferred from the old owner to the new owner. You lose control of it. You lose authority over it. It's no longer yours. You can't determine what happens with that property anymore. That determination belongs to somebody else. And Maori sold that land. So either way, whether they didn't cede sovereignty or they did cede sovereignty, they went on to sell their land and they lost sovereignty over it. That's how it is. And in the second paragraph of Article 2, the British said to, to Maori, we'll buy your land off you. We're not going to steal it. It's yours. Because if you read the speeches of the chiefs in the tent on the 5th of February 1840, that's the day before the treaty was signed, all the chiefs made speeches. Many of them were worried about losing their land. So the British tried to allay their fears by saying, we're not going to steal your land. It's really very, very uncomplicated, Tina Rangatiratanga. But Maori activists have made it so complicated and tried to twist it and make it say what it doesn't say and what was never in the mind of the British. That's how it really is. You know what? It's absolutely insanity that politicians have entertained the radical Maori activist understanding of Tino Rangatiratanga. It's insane. It's completely bizarre and completely uh, unbelievable that they've done this. But you know what? They have. They've simply swallowed hook, line and sinker the Maori activist understanding of Tina Rangatiratanga. That's what they've done. Okay, now I'm going to continue this tomorrow because it's hugely interesting and New Zealanders need to know this. See you tomorrow. Hey, thank you for watching this. Please can you like, share, comment on this video. You know, the media is corrupt in New Zealand. So we actually have to go around them. We have to share it with each other and keep it in-house, unfortunately. Thank you, you lovely New Zealanders, for watching this and helping being part of the solution.